to break you because each of you, as I preached last week, are lights. You're lights in this world. You're lights in your workplace. You're lights in your community. You're lights wherever you go. And what does Satan want to do? Destroy that light. So yes, you're attacked. But man, do we have, you know, do we have the, 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 the king fighter in our corner? Amen. Do we, man, we got the Mike Tyson of all gods. And he's just destroying whatever Satan would have come against us. So thank you, Lord. Let's open in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you, we exalt you, and we thank you, Lord. Oh, you are such a good God. Such a good God. Lord, the, the message I bring today, Father, I know it's given to me by you. And for whomever needs to, to hear it or receive it, Father, I pray that you, you block out any distractions that may or may not be in their minds and allow this time of, of, of preaching and fellowship and worship to soak into their very souls, Father. Let your words that is spoken not return void, Father. Bless us, this house and this day and this message. In your name we pray, Father. Amen. Amen. Today's sermon uh, that I prayed to the Lord and asked for his guidance on what does he want me to talk about is uh, to speak about Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary, the mother of Jesus. As I was praying to God, I said, Lord, what, what specifically do you want to say? And, and Mary was the most loved and blessed woman to walk the earth. And Mary truly was a beautiful woman. And if you're wondering how I know that, every Jesus movie I've ever seen, she's never ugly. Amen. <laughs> so, so we know Mary was an anointed, loved, and appointed woman of God. And I don't often, I always use scripture when I preach, but I don't often give you a large quantity of scripture. But today, we're going to delve pretty deep into the word. We're going to read from Luke chapter 1, verse 26 through 38. Luke 1, verse 26 through 38. And it says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. And he will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. And he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? For I am a virgin. And the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. For the word of God will never fail. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. Verse 39, Mary visits Elizabeth. After a few days, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea to the town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. And at the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women, and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? And when I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because you believe that the Lord would do what he said. And what does Joseph say about all this? If you turn to, uh, I think I left out the scripture, I'm sorry, where, where I should be going. But it says, Joseph accepts his Jesus as his son. I think it's in Matthew. But this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit, because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law 
and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had a mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. That's three times, folks, the Holy Spirit's mentioned in the last few scriptures. And she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name of Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, being a man, you know, of flesh and, and blood, if, if, if I'm Joseph and my wife has just gone away for three months and comes back pregnant, I'm going to have a, probably a different mindset of what exactly happened here, right? And you can kind of see Joseph's mindset of going, wait a minute, hold, hold on, you, you're, you're a virgin, you're pledged to be my wife, you go and you visit Elizabeth for three months, so what's going on here, right? And it took an angel of the Lord speaking to him when he's asleep to have that moment of clarity from God that this is of you and that this child that she carries is your child not my child but I will love it as a father and I will raise it for it is my own and I just uh, admire that moment where Joseph has that clarity from the king of exactly his role in that relationship And then in Matthew verse, I think it's 1 verse 21. I apologize for leaving out the exact scripture. Jesus is presented in the temple. It says, eight days later when the baby was circumcised, his, he was named Jesus. The name given him by the angel even before he was conceived. Then it was time for the purification offering as required by the law of Moses after the birth of a child. So his parents took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. The law of the Lord says... If a woman's first child is a boy, he must be dedicated to the Lord. So they offered the sacrifice required in the law of the Lord, either a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And now the prophecy of Simon, verse 25. And at that time there was a man in Jerusalem named Simon. He was righteous and devout, and he was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him, and he revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord as required, Simon was there, and he took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you've promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal... God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people Israel. Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simon blessed them and said to Mary, the baby's mother, This child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall and many others to rise. He has been sent a, as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your very soul. Now that's probably the longest segment of scripture I've ever read uh, to you all as a pastor in this church or as a minister in this church. And I wanted to really talk about who Mary was to kind of give you a little bit of background, but more so the prophecies and the Holy Spirit that followed them and went with her and went with Joseph and went with the baby Jesus. Uh, if you would, pull up the pictures that I have that I brought in. It's kind of a show and tell. As all of you know, I've been to Honduras uh, three times as a missionary. And I went each eight days for two weeks and then went back the last time for a two-week stay on my third visit. So 8, 8, and 14. And during this particular sermon, uh, this particular night, should I say, I was visiting this church. And on this night... I wasn't supposed to speak. It wasn't supposed to be an opportunity where 
where I was going to take the pulpit or prepare a sermon or go in. On this particular night, after about nine days of, of, of worship and fellowship, and to give you a little background on Honduras, when you go as a minister there, it is a big deal to the people of Honduras. You're, you're traveling almost as a dignitary of the Lord, and they receive you as such. And when you go to a village for lunch, you know, if I invite you out to lunch, take you to Popeye's, we're going to go order a combo meal, sit down, pray together, and go about our day, right? <laughs> That's what our lunches are. In Honduras, when you go there for lunch, it's, you're not just going to that person's house, you're going to the whole village. And what was supposed to be just what you thought a meal, you know, before you go and preach that night, turns into a fellowship of 50, 60, 70 people. Or as we call it in the South, a barbecue, right? And uh, all of these situations, they're singing and they're dancing and they're worshiping God and someone's pulled out a guitar and someone's singing and someone's praising God. And then they ask you, would you speak? Would you lay hands? Would you pray for others? So every single day in Honduras, from breakfast to lunch to dinner, it's a time of ministry and fellowship. And after about nine days, spiritually, you're, you're pretty give out. And so this was my night to just kind of to go and to receive and to worship and to fellowship. And Pastor Lydia, my guide and translator, said that she was so excited to enter this church. And as you'll see, the size of this church is probably the length of one of these rows, uh, one of these columns, times four and times five wide. So it's a very large church. And this entire service was just a praise and worship service. And the people that you're seeing here danced and praised God for about an hour and a half. Which is, if you think about ours, we sing four songs and we're kind of leaning against the pews and we're kind of hanging out, right? Our backs are tight. These people are praising and worshiping. Go ahead and change the next photo. One of the things I love about this church is if you look at these ladies, you see that some of these ladies are, 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 are mothers and the more mature women of the church. But next to them are little girls. Go ahead in the next photo. Next to them are little girls who are singing and dancing and learning from their mothers how to praise God and how to worship God and how to sing and how to dance and how to have fellowship and how to love the Lord. And go to the last photo if you would. And you can just see their hearts now. After about 30 minutes of worship in this church, a huge Congo line began to form. And people literally held the waist of the person in front of them, created a chain throughout the church, and they all kept running around and singing and praising and dancing and worshiping. And it was absolutely beautiful to watch. Because you're seeing 100, 150 people just worshiping God for who He is. And the live band that was playing never stopped. Live, Hubert, imagine how bad your hand would hurt after an hour and a half. It hurts after That's right, it hurts after five minutes. An hour and a half of beating the drums and playing cymbals and singing and dancing. And those worshipers never stopped for the entire hour and a half. But about 45 minutes into the prayer, the lady in the white shirt, which I'll point to her here so you all know who I'm talking about. See this lady right here. About 45 minutes into it, and yeah, I got in the Congo line, I'm not going to lie, I had fun. I ran around the church for a little bit. But as I came back to my seat, this lady is now up front near the stage. And, and you know, it's, it's nothing for any of us to visit a church and see someone praying at the altar, right? No big deal. The only person I knew in this church was Pastor Lydia. And this lady, uh, she, she, she prays, and she prays, and she prays. And she prays. And she prays. And I noticed, after so much praying, that the praying is now turned into weeping. And is now turned into sobbing. And has turned into crying. And, and I'm thinking, a church of this size, where's the altar team, right? Where, where's, the, where's, the, where's the lay ministers? Where's the, where's the ladies of the house to come alongside and kneel next to this person and to pray and to comfort her and to guide her, just like we would, you know, if someone came up for prayer and the, and the Spirit of God is all over them and they're crying. Someone's going to come forward within about two minutes and be next to them and comfort them. But this lady, this lady just kept crying. And I've noticed that. And I, and I'm, I'm, I leaned over to Pastor Lydia and I said, Lydia, can, can, you, can you go help her? Can, can you go sit with her? Can you go pray? No, 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 I can't, I can't wow, well, what's going on here? You know, and I lean over and the 
the guy a few pictures back here who's clapping the symbol. I lean over to him. I can tell he's a leader of the house. And I tap him on the shoulder, and I can't speak Spanish, obviously. But I'm like, hey, can you go help this lady? Can you go help her? She's praying. She's clearly grieving. I don't know what she's grieving about, but she's sobbing uncontrollably. Can you help her? You know, my, and I'm trying to say that in gestures, of course, but I can't quite get it across. He's like, no, no, it's not my place. It's not my place. Okay, all right. Well, what's going on, Lord? And this continues, and this continues, and this continues, and probably about 30 minutes. In 30 minutes, two ladies finally come alongside of her, and they kneel down next to her, and they put their arms around her, and they are crying, and she's crying. And this pool of tears is now formed in front of her, from her and these other ladies, and they are sobbing. And her, her, her sorrow broke my heart because I wanted to help her. But I didn't know how. And I thought, Lord, I don't, I don't know what you're doing here. I don't know why her sorrow is so great. But I can't watch it anymore. I have to help her, Lord. I have to help her. And I went forward and I laid my hands on her just to, just to pray in a prayer of agreement with whatever she was struggling with. And at that moment, she put her arm up on top of the altar. And she pointed and she said, Why? Why have you taken this from me? Why did you do this? What is your point? Why, did you, why, why is he suffering? Why did you do this to us? And I said, Lord, what is it? What, what has she lost? Her grief is so great, Lord. What has she lost? And the Lord showed me. He said, that's Mary. She's seen Jesus at Calvary. <laughs> that's her son. God, just boom, drive me like a stone. And I said, Lord, who are we? Who are we that you would allow us to feel the pain that Mary felt on the day that Jesus died? And, and it just broke my heart for what Mary felt at seeing the passing of her son. And, and the lady stood up and I hugged her neck and I said, do you know, do you have any idea the grief you carry and why? She was like, she said, I do and I don't. I know I hurt and I know why I hurt is right, but I don't know why or for who. And I said, it's Jesus. You're, you're living Mary's life and your Jesus has just died. And she understood, and she sobbed. And, in, and then in that moment, she turned, and she sat down next to the entire pastor of the church. This church of three, four, five hundred people watched the pastor's wife suffer for 30, 45 minutes. And I thought, why? Why, Lord? Because they didn't feel it was their place. That's not right. It is all of our place. Every time you see someone suffering, it's your place. Every time you drive by a homeless person, it's your place. It's your place. It's your place to support the pastors of this church. It's your place to support the leaders of this church. Our leaders are being drugged across the coals right now. It is your place. It's all of our places. Thank you, Lord. There isn't, there isn't a person that God doesn't love. Just like Mary, God doesn't make ugly people. No matter how they appear, no matter what they're going through, right? God does not make mistakes. He doesn't. It's not who He is. That's not the character of the, of the God we serve. He doesn't make mistakes. Thank you. Uh, you see, church... 
the death of Jesus, as mentioned in the scripture in, in, in the book of Mark, the death of Jesus was the sword that pierced Mary's heart and soul. As prophesied earlier in the scriptures, that this birth will pierce your soul. His death was the piercing of her soul. I, as a father, I can't imagine the pain of seeing my child sacrificed. I would lose my mind it, it, and I would have to be killed in order to keep me from climbing that cross. <laughs> a better garrison of Roman soldiers more well healed than me because I'm telling you, I would lay down my life <laughs> for my kids. <laughs> and you better believe I'll do the same for each one of you because you're children of the king. And as a family, we all hurt when one hurts. We all suffer when one suffers. That's why we're sitting in these seats. That's why we're in a fellowship in a house of God, to be here for each other, and to help each other. Pastor Lyle didn't expect you to be here for this, so I apologize if this, if this is inappropriate. <sighs> It showed me, watching that lady suffer for so long, that pastors are often the most unsupported people in the church. We all call the pastor when we need prayer. I challenge you, how, how many times have you all called the pastor and asked him what he needs? Right? How many of us have reached out to Ricky and Debbie prior to their sicknesses and said, what do you need? I'm here for you. What do you got? What, what can I do for you? Do you need another usher? Do you need another person in the ministry? Do you need another person out praying on Saturday mornings? Do you need another person to open the doors on Tuesday nights for the ladies, right? How many of us have made that call? I'm preaching to me. I'm not just preaching to you. I'm preaching to me. How many of us have made that call? But I tell you the truth. The moment my family's sick, the moment I face trauma, who do you think I call? The pastor. And I say, hey, please pray for me. Please pray for me, Pastor. I'm going through a challenge right now in my job, and I need, I need your divine uh, uh, leading to figure out which way should I go, what should I do. My integrity is being challenged. Help me through this, right? Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. And even after I pray to God myself, who do you think I still call? The Pastor. Right? So let's all, especially in time of trauma, be there for them. There's, the, sorry, Lyle. Well, there shouldn't be a day that goes by that you come home and wonder what you're eating right now. That shouldn't be. That should not be. So all of us, all of us, let's do better. Let's make a commitment as a church to do better, to to get a meal train going, to support and to provide. Let, let there not be a want right now during their time of greatest need. Amen? Uh, all right. Bow your, bow your heads and close your eyes with me if you would. Uh, last night I spent one of the longest times I've ever spent creating a sermon for, for, for this house, for this, for this day. The better part of four hours just listening to the Lord and asking Him for Scripture and asking Him for insight and asking Him, what, Lord, what, Lord, do you want me to say? And here's what God says to this house today. God says, tell them I love them. Tell them it breaks my heart to see them throwing aside the sacrifice of Mary and the Son of God by not accepting the gift of salvation. Tell them, as much as we all suffered, I would do it again to not see one soul lost. The hardest part for Mary was knowing Jesus' suffering was the will of God because Jesus told her and his disciples he would be crucified and he would rise again in three days. Amen. My question to you all with every head bowed and every eye closed, what is keeping you from accepting the gift of salvation? And if you're not saved, or if you are saved, pardon me, and you've drifted away, what's keeping you from a better walk with Him? And it does not necessarily pertain to everyone in this building, but think about everyone outside this building. 
everyone you know, everyone you love, everyone you work with, everyone you fellowship with, everyone who stopped you and say, I see the hand of God upon you, will you pray for me? What is keeping it, Lord? What is keeping them from running to you in the way that we should? Maybe it's time for a rededication for you. Maybe the God you know then isn't the God you know now. And I thought about this as I was driving in. I said, Lord, I can stand there and I can tell them how much I love my mother and how much I love my father and how great my earthly mother and father love me. But that is not their daddy. That's mine. And the Lord said, same goes for me, my son. So I invite you all. I invite you all. If, if, if you need a rededication of your life right now, please lift your hand up. And we'll pray together as a church. Please keep all eyes down. This isn't for, for me or anyone else to see. It's for God's glory. If any of you aren't saved and don't yet know Jesus as your Savior, please, please lift your hand up to the Lord. This is your time. The Lord is most certainly here and with you, and He loves you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for Mary, Father. Thank you for the love of a mother. Oh, what a wonderful love that is, Father. Thank you for the love of your Son that came and died for our sins, Lord. Thank you for the love of a Father, Lord, that now sent His Son, that touched Mary to give life and death and birth and resurrection in the name of Jesus, Lord. Oh, Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. We love you. Church, I ask that you repeat this prayer after me. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. We accept your Son as, as King and the risen Savior. Father God, we invite Jesus to come into our hearts, to purify our minds, to send his Holy Spirit into our hearts. Lead us, Father, and guide us and help us. We accept you, Father God, as Father of our lives and protectors of our souls. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's give God a round of applause. Pastor Lau, do you want to address the crowd before you go? Or are you here to receive? Thank you, sir. Well, church, I will uh, pray a prayer of dismissal for you. And I thank you all for coming from the bottom of my heart, as you can see the tears on my face. There is no one that loves you more than the Lord loves you. There is no, no one who would do for you what God will. There's no one who will bless you and walk with you and keep you and protect you like Jesus does and will. Amen? Okay, let's bow our heads. We are dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you and we thank you. Be with us, guide us, love us and protect us and, 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 and make your face to shine upon us, Lord. Let us carry the message spoken today throughout this week and let the word spoken be a light into our path that, that the God of 2,000 years ago that predicted all the events that have surely come to pass will guide our lives as well, Lord. Father, thank you that you love us so much for in modern day times to experience the pain Mary felt, Father, because we know that's a mother's heart and it is beautiful and precious and righteous before you. Bless this church, bless this fellowship, bless this family. Thank you for the church family that we are. In your name we pray, amen. 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 amen.